Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design Magazine and at the Cindy Graham. Okay, I'm sharing a quote I want you to listen to. The sun never knew how great it was until it hit the side of a building. That was spoken from one of the greatest architects of the 20th century, known as the architect of light, Louis Kahn. Fast forward to today, and we still know the power of light on all our spaces, both inside and out, and the enormous effect on all of us. I'm really, really excited today. We'll be discussing light as experiential, lighting through the lens of biophilia, health and wellness, and new lighting tools in the market, as we have two amazing thought leaders, Rick Cook, founder and partner of Cook Fox Architects, and the Cecilia Ramos, Senior Director of Lutron Electronics. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Cindy. Hi, Thanks Cindy. for having us. Hi. Hi. It's so nice to see you guys. Cecilia, I don't know an architect that isn't crazy about you. And then I've come to hear that you were an architect. Yeah, I, was, I came from the ranks. So it's, it's nice to be in a position now where I can support architects and, and understand their needs and wants. So I'm happy to be here. That's amazing. Fantastic. OK. So we have a lot to get through today, a lot of really good, good, good goodies, as I like to say. So uh, let's get started. First of all, let's talk about the spaces we're in right now and our current situation and how like, we are learning a lot about lighting from doing all this Zooming. Rick, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm here in Sneedon's Landing. This is our home at, on Woods Road in Sneedon's Landing. And, uh, one of my favorite parts about the house, besides the connection to nature, is that Cecilia and Lutron and Ketra, um, we work with them to create a circadian rhythm for the house. So even these crazy 70s track light fixtures that we left in the house, we relamped with the, with the Ketra Lutron system. So we're able to run the whole house on a circadian rhythm. So the color temperature of the light inside is the same as outside so we're always striving to make that connection indoors and outdoors and now we can actually do it with the color temperature but the really cool thing too is um <laughs> my wife has a renaissance painting we, we lived in florence when we were first married so wow. there's a picture and there's a color of light in tuscany that's very very specific so we stood there with somebody on a laptop and tuned the lighting until it felt like the tuscan light so this gives amazing opportunities for curators too. So it was an emotional thing. It wasn't, we didn't have a spectrometer. It was just, it felt right. It was an emotional connection that you had to the way the painting was supposed to read. And then we carve that out of the program that runs over the day. So that's my, that's where I am. And my, my little thing about the lighting and the catch. That, first of all, that's amazing. Uh, Cecilia, every single architect should be your advocate the way you just, <laughs> the first two seconds of our interview. Um, uh, amazing. One thing that Cecilia and I were talking about, which is so true, that we're on all these Zoom calls yeah. and we have to think about what we look like. And like if I turned my computer around, I've got three lights going and I'm actually getting at, at this time of day, Cecilia, what do you think? There's all this natural light. It always comes in around four o'clock. So it starts dippling and doing nice things. But I, you need the lighting. That's for sure. You need the lighting, and it's funny that you say that because I've always been kind of a, a lighting geek. I came from yeah. that world and work in it now. And what I've what I've discovered that even being at home, I'm discovering new ways to use it. And so I think there was an early on article in the New York Times right around March, early April, where Tom Ford um, basically was educating the masses on how to light themselves well while doing video calls. And he had a very simple recipe, which was a front lighting that was diffuse a white surface onto which that front lighting would reflect down and then bounce back up and then make sure you have a little bit of light in the background to give yourself a glow. So, you know, of course, working with Lutron and Ketra, I took my Ketra bulbs and I've been experimenting to see, you know, the right way to illuminate myself on video calls. Um, and right now, I mean, I have that set up here and I can easily kind of, you know, tune it down to warm myself up or go cooler, make it daytime nice. conditions. Very uh, cool. I'm going to well, settle in at 3,000 Kelvin and gave myself a fake tan. <laughs> you're, you're definitely glowing over there, Cecilia, for sure. <laughs> That's very, very cool. So what, so what are you using to, um, you're just using, uh, can you show everybody what you're using to adjust the coolness or the warmness? 
Is yeah, the, the coolness of the worms is just a keypad. That's super yeah, easy. Oh, to, no, exactly. And then frankly, I mean, I shouldn't show you all my tricks, but no, no, show us. Just a peek preview. I've got just a par lamp. Uh huh. So all that to say that it's it's not super difficult to set something like this up. Um, and long be with being a lot of fun, it's also you know it helps you look good for these calls. <laughs> so so you know, first thing is like right, we're in a different kind of situation, which is also we're at home, and so there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Rick, when did you set when did you uh, uh, set up your house to be like that? How long has it been? March fifteenth. Oh, you just set it up. So, what kind of changes? It must be amazing, right? Well, really, what happened? I'm sitting at my dining room table because I like to be surrounded by nature. So I have floor to ceiling glass, and I'm sitting at my dining room table, and I get to look out at the same time, and it, it worked out pretty well. I have an office, but somehow I just like being up here a little bit better. But yeah, we've I been find, remote since then. Yeah, no, I find that um, the funny thing is, is that like for any of us who are in our like kind of weekend homes, summer homes or whatever, there's typically more glass than in our apartments in the city. Yeah. And yet it makes it hard to set up where you're going to do your Zoom calls because all that beautiful back lighting from outside just blows us all out. Right, Cecilia? Well, I mean, it's it's amazing. I'm looking at Rick, and he looks picture perfect between the kind of table lamp and the spot lamp, and then the shades on the on the windows. And so, I mean, I think that's one thing that we always have to consider. It's not just the electric light that we live in; it's also controlling the daylight. And so, be that with motorized shades or whatever, you got to marry those two together to get that balanced calibration. That might be one thing for one event and something different for something completely different. So for a Zoom call, maybe your shades are down, Rick, and then as you finish the Zoom call and you start typing emails, you want a little bit more light and you raise them. So I think it's that flexibility of controlling all those elements of light that creates the environments that we feel most comfortable in. Yeah, absolutely. Rick, so, so tell us, so you guys were selected to design the Luchon Experience Center, which is yeah. very exciting. It just won an NYC by Design Award. Congratulations. Thank but you. I want to know from you what what you learned because it really is when like when I went through it all, it is like first of all, it's an amazing tool for everyone to learn how right. to use the light, but it's so much fun as well. <laughs> It is. Well, for me, I've been a little bit obsessed with the fact that we experience our spaces with all of our senses. So even though we all want to get in your magazine, it uh, it's a two-dimensional format, and it can't possibly convey what places feel like, what the experience is like. And that all started uh, 20 years ago with a project called the Center for Wellbeing, when we started exploring biophilic design. But at the same time, Courtney Ross, and thank you for publishing it back then. Uh, yes, that was a long time ago. 2002, in fact, yeah. um, uh, the the founder came from a came from a, an art background, and uh, the funding came from uh, media. So we started looking at how to light somebody to look good under the camera, so the kids look good when they play basketball. And then we started talking about what the place smelt like, and and baking flatbreads. And we moved the cafe to the second floor, so. We, could hear the birds chirping so it was a, and you took your shoes off and you got a tactile feedback so this idea that you fully experience the spaces you're in and you remember them with, with with all of your senses I think lighting is like that and so when Cecilia and the team asked us if we would help them accomplish their experience center for me it was really about you have to go there and you have to experience it you have to feel what it's like to have the light change or have a painting really change completely in front of your eyes by the change of the light. And we've all had concepts like presets in lighting, but the combination of Lutron, we were pretty excited when they bought Ketra because Ketra was yeah. the light engine that we said, this is the light engine that's gonna do everything. It's gonna allow curators to tune paintings. It's gonna do circadian rhythm, but it didn't have the technological backup. So when Lutron bought Ketra and put those two together, we just really wanted to help them pull off an experience center where somebody like you could come and it wasn't about looking at it, but feeling it change. Right, it was the experience. It's a great name for it. Cause right, you go into it and you're completely transported. And I think, you know, for an architect that hasn't become obsessed with lighting the way you have, and by the way, many are, which is a good thing for a yes. But you know, like you learn a lot from just being in that experience center. So thank, thank you for that. What's your favorite, what's your favorite part? Actually, for me, the favorite part is 
just when they run it and they run the full range of color temperature. And mm -hmm. then who's ever running the show says, this is the exact same light engine, what you might call light bulb. It's the exact same thing. It's purely programming. And because we've done things where we change color temperatures of lamps and we'll put it on dual tracks and we'll do things like that. But the fact that you can go all the way from intensely red all the way to cool blue, completely smooth, all from the exact same light engine, the same light fixtures, what we would call light fixtures or light bulbs. That, that's my favorite part. I think. <laughs> yeah. And Cecilia, it must have been like just a completely different experience for you as somebody representing the company to be able sure. to bring people there and have them get really excited about the tools. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it was one of those projects that it just came together and the team was fantastic. We had Rick Cook and his team and we had Steve yeah. Margulies and on lighting. And when we kind of programmed the whole thing, um, we decided to you know story tell via narrative and so as rick said as opposed to kind of just putting objects on the wall it was you sit there and i always like to say to get light you have to marinate in it like you have to actually soak in it and understand it um and to see like rick design this beautiful curved white plaster wall beautiful. which becomes the spine of the space and throughout like a sequence of maybe 20 scenes that we kind of you know dance through and you see the whole space transform. And so you see it transforming, not just in color temperature, but also in the directionality of the light. So at some moments that wall flattens, in other moments it kind of gets sculpted. And I think in bringing architects and designers into the space, like they they get it, as Rick says, like they see it and they get it and they understand the, the like full potential of what light can do, or maybe not the full, because we're just scratching the surface. Right. Ultimately it's up to the designer to really take it to the next level. That's right. But we're we're teasing, you know, the the power of light and painting space. And and that's and that's fun to see people's eyes kind of pop and say, whoa, this is a new tool that I could have. Yeah, I love by the way, I love that, you know, you even have a little hospitality suite in there. And I'm always wondering right. if like <laughs> be staying over. <laughs> we don't Airbnb it, I promise. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. And, thought and about Rick, it a couple of times. You, you did. Well, congratulations. It's a beautiful project and, and really um, a great representative of what you can do with light, right? And I love that then you just said, okay, I'm going to take that home right now and I'm going to make changes. Now we have some more light applications that we're going to talk about, but Cecilia, there are some new tools out there for designers to work and control light. Can you share some of it? Yeah. I mean, you know, interestingly enough, I think the needs of light moving forward are different than they were three months ago. Um, and it was quite opportune, in fact, because we just recently launched a new light control system called Athena, which is essentially light and lighting control and shades all married together with the Ketra light engine as a possibility, but you could have any other light engine you want. And, you know, when we were envisioning this, it was a simple, easy to use, flexible system um, that really puts the power of kind of this lighting design in the designer's hands. So what does that mean? You can you know, set up your lighting and then the architect or the lighting designer via an app can make all these scene changes, dial it in, get it, get it just right. Um, and as we find ourselves again, kind of reconsidering our architectural spaces as we re-enter uh, the workforce and um, go from our homes back into the environment to have a system like that, which allows the utmost flexibility um, whether that's flexibility in scenes or flexibility in who can program it. Um, and then also just keeping it super basic and simple. I think that's that's one of the big ones that you know we're excited to kind of bring forth. And, and I think in terms of the Ketra light that we've been talking about, which is this color temperature changing fixture um, that also does saturated colors should you want. Um, I think the possibilities of what that can do um, are just, the surface is just being scratched. You know, every day I learn new applications and new creative u w ways of using it from, from designers. And I think that's a tool that we're gonna see just take it to the next level. I remember, I remember being in the Experience Center, now yeah. show from Experience Center, and really getting excited when you were showing what you can do to, um, to highlight art in the, in yeah. the best way, like Rick, like you were saying, with that Renaissance painting. So I want, there are, there are a couple of projects that we can talk about. One, the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Ketra did? Yeah, so I mean, I think the possibilities of art with Ketra lighting are like boundless, but in the Art Institute of Chicago specifically, it was a curatorial restoration um, move where they had, you know, a 16th century sculpture made, made out of wood of St. Catherine 
Catherine. And when they were illuminating with typical lights, they found that the complexion was quite chalky and gray and it didn't kind of resonate historically to what that wood would have looked like hundreds of years ago. And so the curators played with the catcher light and ultimately dialed in a mix of color temperatures, uh, but also a kind of facet of light called vibrancy, which is you know, what peaks of wavelengths of light do you have in a white light? So white light's ultimately the amalgamation of all colors. And so if in a 3000 Kelvin light fixture, you peak the reds, then you'll see the reds render more vibrantly. So anyways, using that technology and a bit of kind of in situ uh, testing, they were able to kind of find that perfect recipe that restored that um, sculpture to its you know, 16th century state or state that they felt was right for the sculpture in this day and time. Which, uh, so that was pretty Which cool. was it? Was it was it cooler, warmer, mix? Of, I know you said it was a mix. Yeah, it was actually a mix of um, 2,850 and 2,700, I believe. So they had like one on the head, one on the body, one had a little bit more vibrancy. So again, it just, you give them the tools and they find what's right. <laughs> I love that. By the way, I know I know you guys are geeking out about lighting, but it, yeah, reminds, are. <laughs> me a lot of, it reminds me a lot of printing because we're always talking about yeah. like how we're printing colors and what gets more blue and more, you know, when we're getting more red on, on the printing. So, um, I totally can geek out with you, even though I don't understand it as well as you all do. <laughs> okay, so there's another one, the Nelson Atkins Museum. Right, so the Nelson Atkins Museum was a, a different application in the block galleries where they were illuminating impressionist paintings. So they have a beautiful Monet water lilies painting. And you know, I think what, what's fascinating what they did there is that they're using it as a pedagogical tool. So as the curators walk people through the museum, and you know, story tell some of those you know paintings and the in all aspects of them that they're able through an iPad to kind of dial in white light always, but white light that pops different colors and different layers of the painting mm. um, in order to use it as a storytelling opportunity and educational opportunity. So I mean, if you think about you know Monet as a painter in Giverny, you know he was painting in, in broad daylight. So. That's another way to kind of look at light and art, which Rick alluded to in his Tuscan painting. You could also dial it in to be the light in which the painting was conceived, um, or you could light it as you want now in the Contemporary Gallery and Museum. So um, lots of options, and, and I love kind of thinking through where it can go, but I would have never guessed that the Nelson Atkins would use it as a, a storytelling tool, which is quite neat. No, that's amazing. And also, um, I think about hospitality and Right. It's kind of interesting for us too because a lot of times we're getting photography of hospitality that casts very yellow, right. like right. and which we hate to print like that. We're always trying to pull out the, the yellow, which might be better to be in it than yep. the, than the way that I need to use it, right? Yep. You know, in hospitality, I think we've seen a trend of lighting go very dim and warm, almost emulating incandescence, right. which has, you know, it has a perfect application and in certain spaces, it's just what you need. Uh, but there was a recent museum project, Moxie in Seattle, where I think they implemented a lighting that felt like that. Um, and ultimately the lobby space was underutilized because during the daytime with daylight coming in, the light felt too dim and too yellow. Um, and so that was an application where, you know, we came in as Ketra relamped, which is great because it's an easy retrofit. And um, ultimately they were able to, as, you know, Rick is, you know, telling the story of color temperature changing throughout the course of the day, have a brighter, whiter light by day, bring it down to those golden hues by night. And they saw like a complete transformation of use of that space. So with a small intervention, you can have a big, big impact. Rick, are other, the other architects in your office get as excited about it as you do? more so really <laughs> yeah yeah but the latest is is that uh we have the new google headquarters and we're using view glass which sends a little bit of a blue tint on the inside so now we're working with ketra to see if we can cancel that out because you know because that's no good <laughs> no good no good that's no good okay but rick i also i also wanted to congratulate you on that incredible the incredible office that you have you know, oh, I, you. it's not, I don't, I don't often um, publish architects own um, for many different reasons, but that project is really, really something special. And it also is close to your heart, you. right? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, there was an awful price paid, so it is very close to our heart. And uh, and it, it's soul searching when you need to put your time and money into a project where your clients come, because our job is to be advocates for what we believe is great design. So when you do your own studio, and we had left a studio that had 14 foot high ceilings. So we moved to a mid, you know, uh, I guess a pre-war trophy would be what the Empire State Realty Trust would call it. So much lower ceilings. So we had to be so much more careful with light and redirect the light and bounce it off the ceiling. So we get that indirect light back down. And then, of course, we rented, we, we say we rented three terraces with a studio in between. So it was the, it was the terraces, given a home for our bees, given a new home for the, uh, for the apiaries, uh, for the bees. But I, I think that what Steve Marley's was a lighting designer for the Experience Center, and he used the term lighting is a full immersion experience. You know, it's not just optical, it's you, you feel it, you're fully immersed. So we were trying to do the same thing in our studio, that you feel immersed in this idea about built biophilic design and connecting to nature. I mean, it must have really changed how everybody like feels, works, lives in that office. Um, it, it did. And one of the things, you know, a lot of us really love polished concrete floors or hardwood floors, but our office is carpeted in part because of the, the acoustical quality of that, that it's quiet and meditative in, in its own way. And uh, so, so those things were were really, really important to us. And then interestingly, I, uh, our friends at the IWBI, it was the first well gold. It's of course lead platinum, but it was the first well gold in New York. Uh -huh. And there were some things about like the column of hand washing water that had to be whatever, however many inches is, 10 inches, I believe. And I had to remake the sink and I was so mad about it, thinking oh, this no. is crazy. This is crazy that we have to do this. But yeah. then think about how forward thinking they were right. about health and wellness now because it's not it's not just a fun idea of a fringe set of designers who really care about it. everybody we're all in the healthcare business now washing hands efficiently is really important so they were spot on right and they're way ahead of their time so it was kind of interesting following the the well standard and living through that was important and we just did their uh their headquarters iwbi's headquarters we did. Which is oh, the, wow. first, the, the first well platinum version too that's amazing. And, and are you, um, are you thinking about when you're getting back there and what other, what other changes um, you're going to have to make? Yeah, we're going through the whole distancing, traffic patterns, everything you could imagine changing as many things to touch list. And I think that's one of the things with lighting too and technology thing we'll get, we'll get everything touch list we possibly can. And it will be what Paul Dara from Google calls no regret improvements. Like maybe it wasn't a good idea we all touched the same elevator call button. Maybe it wasn't a good idea we all touched the same bathroom door handles. And so we'll have no regret improvements, I think, moving forward. So we're trying to do those things. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to getting back. I mean, we have great daylight there. And that's one thing that we've been doing with artificial light, trying to be as close to daylight as possible. It's why the circadian rhythm is so important. We have four exposures. So you, the sun is brilliant. I sit on one side of the studio in the morning because it's got a bright light to get my quiet time and get started. And I sit in the total opposite end of the studio because we get these beautiful sunsets over the Hudson. So I would move for the, the daily color temperature. And now we can do it with lighting. Thanks to Cecilia. Cecilia, don't, don't you love that? He literally moves throughout the day. Sunlight. <laughs> sunlight. I think that unbelievable we'll have to take our occupancy sensors and just kind of you know migrate the space yeah. you and make sure that the lights are turning on and off as they go that's a battery yeah. power so you just move them and off they go <laughs> that's amazing I, I, I do think on the on the wellness side and the yeah. health side after post-covid which we alluded to we've all been talking a lot about air filtration and bipolar ionization and hepa filters and all these things and we've made advances clearly in indoor air quality but I think we're, we're still on the verge of a big breakthrough on the quality of light and what it does to us. Yeah. Like we know connections to nature, lower stress levels, cortisol levels. And I think as we get higher quality light, we're going to be able to make people feel better. I, I love what you were talking about earlier on, which is that this one project should have sort of changed your whole 
the whole course of your career. Can you like Absolutely. dig in a little bit more about that, the human connection that architecture and light can play? Well, for me, um, the Center for Wellbeing was about a fusion of Eastern and Western concepts to health and fitness. So we really started all over again. And we were really focused in on how we experience space with all of our senses, not just the visual, not just beautiful magazines. And so it was about taking your shoes off and getting a tactile feedback. It was about smelling flatbreads, cooking in the ovens. But uh, always it's about connecting to the best possible light. Uh, when, when you get up into the tree tops, the light changes, you open the windows and you hear the birds chirping. So it's always, a, I think architects have always been seeking the best, and artists have always been seeking the best possible light. And what we discovered there was that when we, when we were filming people, they weren't looking as good as they were in natural light. So because the founder uh, came from a media company, we brought in the best light and they said, this, these are the light fixtures you need to use if you want people to look good on film. And so this idea that you could really change the way people look in situations like this by using different lights was, was kind of mind blowing that it wasn't just daylight, but you needed to tune the type of artificial light you had to make people look natural. But that really changed the course of, uh, of my life, really, uh, about this exploration that you can make people feel better by being connected in nature. And, you know, by the way, we have been connected all these years without really, really knowing it because That's I published it. that first project. Now, all these years later, I was publishing the, your office, then you get the award for Lucha. Like, we were meant to be together today. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> and do you think, i just curious, you know, because I was, you know, opening with Louis Kahn because we think of him as the master of light. Do you think at that time, do you think it was more about the architecture? Like, the human experience is so, and wellness is something that um, obviously is going to move us all. Um, forward. Do you, do you think it was a different kind of experience back then? Um, I think it was almost always associated with natural light. Right. So Corb said, you know, reveal something in light and I'll know what you mean. You know, you'll move my soul when you, when you re reveal a form in light. Yes. And light has always been uh, viewed as good. Follow the light. Don't go into the dark. Right. Um, right. Biblical references to light. Um, and so I think that this idea of revealing things in light, you see better in light, things are more transparent, they're more open, it's always been idealized. And architects and artists have always talked about it. Ar yeah. Architects went out to the East End, architects went out to Provincetown. Somebody tells me that's because they got the light bounce off the ocean, off the cloud cover, and back down on their work. So they got quantifiably better light. They just intuitively knew it. Right. Um, so... I, I think artists and architects, everybody visual is always talking about the light. Yeah, I thought I just sort of like, it made me think of like him, like saying, we were talking about that forever. We just didn't use that terminology, right? Yep, exactly. Right. But they also didn't have you guys, uh, Cecilia, either, which is, <laughs> is kind of interesting how much, how much more of a tool it can be. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it's all about understanding what medium you have to work with and then understanding the possibilities and importance of the control of it, right? Because you can throw light everywhere, but unless you're able to dial it and control it, um, it doesn't sing. And I think one of my favorite light books is a book called In Praise of Shadows, which is a Japanese story about the importance of light relative to darkness. And so I think that's always important, you know, to remember that you got to control it to create those balances of light in, in moments of pause and darkness. That's very, very beautiful. Okay, so we will pause. Uh, on that, in our light, not in the darkness, but in the light, with our good friends at Lutron. Rick, uh, fantastic to see you all. We should continue Thank this. You. This should be the first of a good. series or something. There's something very, very good here. Um, but thank you great. so much. Um, sorry we can't be together, but um, sending you all virtual hugs and, and go towards the light, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> we will do that. And thanks, Lutron. Thanks so much to our friends at Lutron. Thank, Thank you. you, Cindy. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Cindy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Welcome to Design TV. I'm Pamela Jacarino, Editor-in-Chief of Lux Interiors and Design. Today, I am thrilled to be speaking with a special guest, the celebrated decorator, author, and all around the seat, Charlotte <laughs> Moss. She is a major tour de force on creativity and an inspiration to so many of us. Charlotte, it is so nice to see you. Oh, it's great to see you. Yes. So, um, welcome. So you are someone who appreciates the luxury of time and place and seeing and noticing and being aware. And then you harness all of that beauty into everything that you do, Charlotte. How have you been adapting to everything? Tell us. Gosh, you know, I mean, that is, that is what we've had the luxury of a little more time to sort of be in our space. Um, to be quiet, I'm out of the city, so I have all that um, peripheral noise um, edited out of my life. Um, you know, it is, I, I can say so many things about what we're going through right now, but, um, and how it has affected me even creatively. But, you know, I love riding my bike. I love uh, getting in my kayak. Um, I love my walk with my dogs, which I never really get to do, except once in a while in the city. And I do that every day, riding my bike and exercising more. I mean, it, it has done a lot, I think, to all of us to get us more in tune with ourself and our own, what's going on in our own head. That's, it's yeah. true. I, right. When time sort of pauses and it's quiet, A, you, you realize how frantic I think we all were before all of this, but it does, it does, you know, when you have these moments of just you know, a pause um, and time, it, it, it is very interesting. Um, so, you know, I think these times are just gonna impact, they are, they're having an impact and, and long-term an impact on sort of how we think and feel about our homes as we're, as we're sheltering at home and have spent more time probably in our homes than ever before. How, you know, I'm sure you've thought about how priorities will shift and, maybe how the pendulum will swing and what is your perspective on sort of what's going to happen and what is happening with the design and decoration, how our relationship to our homes? Wow. Well, so, so I, I see, I hear two questions there. There's one like is four in most of my, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going like to four questions in together. <laughs> that's all right. Now, if I can just remember them, that'll be a real miracle. Um, I think, you know, there's the macro of, our vulnerability and understanding our vulnerability now um, and our mortality. I mean, that is, that is a really big thing. Um, but, you know, drilling it down to walking in your front door and walking around your house and doing it for months. It, um, it I think my husband said it best the other day when I said, you know, I really, I've watched my hornbeam turn green. I've never been able to do that. Um, they're either sticks or they're green when I come back here. And now I've watched the progress and every little bit of progress on those trees has been so gratifying. And so you learn to appreciate those things that in the past we may have just passed by. And my husband said, well, how did you expect to see it? Because in the city you go from building to building. And boy, that really caught me up short thinking about, wow, really? How boring is that when I can watch the hornbeam turn green? Um, but I think that being at home, I mean, so many different levels. I have been able to watch my garden turn green. I've watched my tulips and my daffodils, which usually I'm just either getting the beginning or the end, but not the full blush of, of that. And that's been really fabulous to be able to walk outside and um, to hear birds. Yes all the birds. I record the birds. They're so soothing. Um, they're like my, my friends every morning in the garden when I'm walking the dogs. And um, that to me is just a basic thing that, you know, I loved doing when I was a kid. And now it's all sort of coming back. Um, just being able to spend the time doing cooking dinner. Okay. So, Cooking dinner for me is an absolute chore. 
Um, I hate cooking to eat. I don't mind admitting it. Admitting it. I have great cooking friends, and they're all going to be mortified when they hear me say this on tape. But I hate cooking to eat. I'd rather be reading a book. I'd rather be doing what we've been doing, walking, watching a documentary, uh, needle pointing while I'm watching that documentary. But cooking, I don't care about doing. But now I've gotten in the kitchen and I've gotten a rhythm. And every time you open a drawer, every time you open a, anything in the pantry, it's a reveal. <laughs> oh, that needs to be redone. Oh, we need a new one of those. Oh, this needs to be edited. Send this to so-and-so. Every time you open a drawer or a closet, there is this revelation of, there's just too much stuff and I need to get rid of some. Well, don't say that. You're a, you're a great collector and we want you to stay that way. But how do you think that it's very interesting, everything that you say, and I'm nodding my head in agreement because I, I have noticed, I'm like, my everyday dining chairs are like, I need new ones immediately. How have I not noticed this before? Because I haven't been here. But what, how do you think all of this, what's happening sort of in our heads, can you make a crystal ball prediction? Like, how do you think this is going to impact the design industry? And the product that that you know is put out there and you know do you have any thoughts about that well i think i think that prioritization of what's important uh really hits home you um you know we prioritize our daily life you know what's important to us what has to get done when it has to get done on a daily basis but then there are the, what i call the big the big priorities of life and I, I look around and I go, I, I just can't imagine that people aren't going to want things uh, simpler than they are, less complicated. Um, I think we've been heading in some directions for a long time in terms of, you know, cleanness, but things, things just, um, I mean, I'm never going to say things are not important, but I think we will cherry pick more um, when it comes to buying things. But our home is, our home is it. I mean, if ever there's been a time in our life when we've understood the importance of home being that center of our universe, that that nest that once the door is closed, it's yours. And while we're all ready to just come out with both dukes here, ready to get back at things, um, we are all very grateful to have it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think we will, you know, we'll still love to decorate. I mean, I just can't get that out of my jeans and I can't <laughs> imagine other people can either. Um, we'll all, we'll love all the things we've always loved. We'll collect the things we've always collected. I think maybe the shift will be, and I hope because I really believe this personally in thinking about others more. Um, yeah. I think that's, you know, we've all been thinking about ourselves and our house and our own worries and our wants and everything. But now, now I think the time is, what are other people going to need from me? Yeah. And I feel, I feel very fortunate to be in that position to be able to um, think about it and, and do something about it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of human empathy that that's happening right now is everyone Huge. experiences a lot of the same you know, feelings at the same time that really does foster a lot of just, you know, empathy for, for everybody. Um, one of the things that I know brings you a lot of joy, it has also been one of your Instagram challenges is um, collaging, which I, I just, I think it's a very therapeutic pursuit. Anybody looking behind me? Yes. Giant board, which I have done as a therapeutic pursuit, like an homage to Charlotte Moss. <laughs> I know, you know, talk about, talk about collage and for the people that are, that are um, listening in, um, why, why it's meant so much to you and how they can, um, you know, what they can do to get something out of it, to give back. You know, I think um, collage for me, I mean, I started doing it as a child and um, I wasn't great at drawing. So this was another way of being able to sort of express a vision. Like you said, you've got this giant mood board behind you, you know, and it, those are things that appeal to you. It is a great democratic art form. Anybody can do it with scissors and a glue stick. Um, 
old books that have lost their covers, uh, magazines. I mean, anything that a glue stick can hold down on a piece of paper can be part of a collage. Um, and it is a way of also enabling you to sort of define what you like. You know, as you look through images, there, you know, could be a, um, a sailboat on the water somewhere, or, you know, it, it could be any image that just appeals without having to think about it and overthink it. You just rip it, cut it, glue it, you're done. Um, and then I think <laughs> you realize all those... something about yourself that maybe you never knew. <laughs> exactly. When it all comes together, it, it is revealing. You know, we do these things for our clients. We've always done that for our clients. If they don't have, you know, clippings and books with, you know, uh, post-it notes on them, you know, we try to do that for them. And because those images, when they come back to us, tell us so much um, before we, but it's part of our initial, what I call interview dialogue with a client. We can look at those images and discern, wow, monochromatic. Oh, all pale colors. Wow, look at this one, high contrast. Who knew? So you can learn from those images that sometimes if you can't articulate your vision, you really can. The picture does speak a thousand words. Um, so I've, I've always been doing it. And now I'm, I'm doing 3D. So oh, I'm, do I'm wondering, I'm inquiring minds like me do want to know, and you're such to me, you're just such a creative woman and also a doer. So what have you been doing? Is this like new, your 3D collages? And what have you been doing to stay, to keep yourself stimulated? And, and, and you know, you usually are traveling and going to many different things. I know you're, you're obviously in nature a lot, but what are you doing to be creative? And is this 3D collage part of all of that? 3D collages has been um, years, and I mean years of collecting. I have a huge cabinet in my studio at my office that is everything from antique hardware to um, textile fragments that have little stories in them, whether it's tapestry or toile. And um, it's pretty diverse. And sort of what's been resonating, it's been humming around in my head for a long time, are the themes of those collages. Um, since I've been out here, you know, the week Monday to Friday is Zoom, Zoom, you know? Um, <laughs> so the, the nighttime is uh, spent one way and the weekends are spent foraging. Um, I go to the beach, uh, to a beach particularly because it's good for shelling and I've been collecting masses of shells. And so I think one of the first one that I will do will be my, my collage of, of seashells. So done are they sort like of still lifes? Charlotte? Yes, they're like still lifes, you know. Um, you, you know Joseph Cornell's work. Yeah. Of, of, yeah. So it's 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 in shadow boxes and it's in frames, but um, I haven't started the shadow box uh, uh, thing yet because most of what I've done is accumulate antique frames over the years, and they're gilt, they're wood, they're any combination, they're painted French frames, and we make a background of uh, old wood that we age further and then we stain. And then all those elements are applied to create the stories. So I think the first one will be that. But you know, this whole time, um, it's just been time to um, be with yourself. Yeah. You know? um, and I think that is what a lot of us, especially in New York, where just, as my husband said, you bang around going from building to building, which was so depressing when I heard that. But um, it is a, uh, a revelation sometimes when you have that time to yourself to define the things that really define you. Yeah. Well, um, it, it forces you into thinking of like, you know, what's important, what do I value and how do I want to, you know, especially I think on the weekends, I do agree like Monday through Friday, it is just the productivity is like through the roof, zoom, zoom, zoom. And then you know, it's like Friday night comes, you know, what are you, what are you doing and how are you spending? Oh, I'm like a, I'm like a kid that when the school bell rang, it's like, it's Friday. And it's <laughs> such a relief sometimes now. Um, 
but you know, I go on my bike and um, I've been posting some videos of photos that I've taken when I've been on you know, a walking in the country or riding the bike. Um, there was a storm and I was out walking the dogs afterwards and there were all of these branches on the ground that had lichens on them and all sorts of stuff. And I went, great. I went, I got the Jeep, we loaded up the back and I made this big arrangement with, you know, wild and woolly um, debris from the storm. So I think I've sort of been that, that foraging Miss Havisham type for a long time. <laughs> You've also initiated many wonderful Instagram challenges. I have taken part in a few of them. Tell us about them. We started the challenges, Pam, because, you know, my staff is in four different states right now um, with family. And I said, you know, how do we stay connected and how do we stay connected to our Instagram family? And let's have some fun and everybody's mind needs to be taken off of this. And yeah. so when I instituted collage, of course, that's what I love. So I thought, well, anybody can do that. We're not asking them to, you know, bake a baked Alaska necessarily, but um, every, anyone could do it. So I said, but this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna raise money. We're gonna raise money for Feeding America and I'm gonna donate $100 for every collage. That was amazing. We, yeah. we got to just short of $100,000 and I rounded it up so we could, you know, I hate odd lots, so, you know, give an even number. And our family foundation gave $100,000 to Feeding America. Amazing. And, awesome. and then the second fundraising effort, everyone else contributed and we ended up donating $46,000 to No Kid Hungry. Um, thank you very much. PepsiCo uh, matched every dollar. And uh, those are two great organizations that are going to have an increasing need for funding. Absolutely. Yeah. And, ab um, absolutely. So it's I'm working, I'm working on a third, but um, that's going to be longer lead time and much bigger project, which I, know you're, I, you're a woman. I will talk to you about. I know, I know you always have something up yours, which is one of the many, many reasons that we, that we really admire you um, so much. Um, I have some rapid fire questions, but I also just want to ask what, um, so, you know, what do you, what is going to come out from Charlotte Moss from all of this? Is there like, I mean, and I don't know before all of this, if you had like a collection, you, you, you always have a book in you. Do you, was there something planned or have you been thinking about something that that's going to come to us later this year or next year or you're oh, not you, ask, you ask such great leading questions Pam. <laughs> <laughs> um, I usually have about 20 questions wrapped up in the one. <laughs> well right now I'm under contract to do another book for Rizzoli which will be out spring of 21 it's uh flowers are the are the subject a little bit of history, a little, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. That's how I like doing them. My books are collages. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm working on. And then I'm working on something else that we've just started that we haven't announced yet that will be a book and it will be a fundraiser. And it'll be based on a precedent that had been set before, um, you know, early in the 20th century. So, um, um, and I know that's being very vague and everything, but we haven't announced it yet, but, um, a lot of different people will get a chance to contribute to this book and um, we can raise some serious money this way. Good, oh. that's, that's wonderful. Well, we look, we look forward to it. So I, I have some quick rapid fire questions. If okay. You're okay. Okay. I'm ready. These are like my Proust questions. Okay, Charlotte Moss, what is your favorite word? Yes. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I will. Yes, yes, yes. What is your least favorite word? I'm not sure. I hate ambivalence. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Mm, time alone. Time alone, and preferably time alone in nature. What turns you off? Mm, what turns me off? Lack of self-awareness. What sound or noise do you love? Birdsong. <laughs> Birdsong. 
What sound or noise do you not love? Oh, leaf blowers. Oh, <laughs> oh I hate leaf blowers. I put on my, my headphones. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Hmm. You know, that's so hard because I'd love to try a lot of things, but you know, I think I'd, I'd love to sing. Oh, that's interesting. I feel like you've done so many different things. So that, that, that's an interesting answer. What profession would you not like to do? You know, I think there are a lot of things I'd probably be better at than others. Let me just say that I'd be willing to try anything that I have to try, you know, um, because I think, well, I don't know. I don't know how to, I wouldn't want to say I would, would never want to do this because that's somebody's job. I would be willing to do anything that I had to do. Is that? Yes, I completely understand that because you're like a yes, yes. And you know, mm -hmm. you make an adventure of it and you're curious and you're creative. So you would transform something mundane into something interesting and beautiful, I feel, I feel. Um, so my last question is, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear when you arrive at the pearly gates? Dancing music, give me some soul music. Dance all the way in those pearly gates. <laughs> well, that is, that is wonderful. It's been so good to talk to you. And as I said, I mean, I just love the, the passion and your creativity and also how we're all able to sort of grasp a little bit of Charlotte Moss through your Insta challenges and, and your books and everything. So thank you thank so you. much and get back out there on your bike and commune with nature. And we're gonna stay tuned to see what you've got coming next for all yes, of us. Yes, and do stay tuned for those challenges. We will, thank you okay. so much, Charlotte. Okay, thanks, Pam.